Okay, how are the next afternoon? Great? I think you were mesmerized by that wonderful song of Brother Norman. <laughs> Praise God. Church, I'm so excited this afternoon, as always, because we're going to hear the finale, right? The last message of this five series of messages entitled, Be Fruitful Now. We have a couple of interruptions. They, they are really not interruptions, but we have some special occasions in between. And we celebrated Father's Day. And um, uh, we celebrated, uh, I guess, uh, uh, Independence Day last Sunday. But today, God has given us this wonderful time to understand this fifth and last message of the series, Be Fruitful Now. You know the importance of us bearing fruits, right? And uh, this is all in line with our theme for this year, living a fruitful life. If you remember the first message we heard about this uh, the particular series, you know, I feel excited because uh, especially when it's, uh, it's the last message of a particular series because it is some, some sort of an accomplishment for every one of us to be able to finish a series that God has given us to understand. The first message about is about God, God's plan of reaching the world. Am I breaking up? God's plan in reaching the world. That was the first message. The second message was rediscovering the growth in gospel. You know, this is all in line with the, our ability to be part of this plan of God, right, to reach the world. And the best, I guess, example that we have in rediscovering the go in gospel is the third message, right? Jesus, the master soul winner. And if we have this desire to actually go, the fourth message we heard was about the harvest. Remember, the harvest is ready and we need reapers now. And I think our message for this afternoon is very relevant and practical. It's about how we're going to apply these four things that we have heard about being fruitful now. This is something that we have all uh, relationships today. We can relate about having friends, right? To be able to reach them out, to be able to help them, and to be able to bear fruits now. The title of our message this afternoon is One Pair, Dead, of, dead or Alive. No, I'm just kidding. That one Pair, Stretcher bearers. You might be wondering, what, what does it mean, stretcher bearers, right? In our picture here, right, there is this man who is uh, paralyzed. You will hear this uh, particular story this afternoon. In fact, this story was found in three of the four Gospels. And uh, you know, it tells us that it's quite important and relevant. And there's a lot of uh, teachings that we can glean and learn about this story, about the story that Jesus healed this paralytic. And it is about his friends who are really helping him out. That's why they are bearing the stretcher, they are carrying the stretcher. Right? That's why the title of our message is One Dead Stretcher Bearers. If you have your Bibles with you, right, our text is found in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 2. Okay, this can also be found in Matthew, Matthew chapter 9. And these stories can also be found in Luke chapter 5. But I think uh, what I would like to share with you this afternoon uh, is, is very much uh, shown in uh, the Gospel of Mark. And I would like us to focus on this. Right? We have 12 verses that we're going to, to hear and study. And this is quite really enjoyable. I'm hoping all our messages, our sermons every Sunday uh, are really enjoyable. But this one, I would like to excite you because this is really a story of what's going on. I, I know most of you, if not all, are interested in stories, especially one that has um, climax on it and, and, and a happy ending, right? So this uh, six, uh, uh, or, I'm sorry, 12 verses, we have three points that I would like to share with you. Right? And we are not going to read our text initially, but I would like you to open your Bibles and we're going to, to read this as we go along with our message for this afternoon. So open your Bibles, uh, I'm hoping we have Bibles, Mark chapter 2, right? the second chapter of Mark. And the first thing I would like to share with you about this, one ten stretcher better, right? it's the story about having helpful friends. Do we have friends? Right? Can we relate uh, to, to this kind of relationship that God has given us? You know, in, in some other messages I have shared with you, right? that, that 
chosen relationship between God and His people is the relationship between Father and His children. Remember that? The chosen relationship between Jesus and His church, right? Is the relationship between a husband and a wife, right? Between a bride and a groom. But there is also one kind of relationship that Jesus wants to, to, to ex us to experience. And we can all relate to this. And that's why it's very fitting and relevant to have uh, this kind of relationship. We all need and we all have friends, right? Do we enjoy our friends? Do we have friends today? Yeah. Right? I'm hoping we have, right? We, we enjoy them, they enjoy us. And in this particular story, the power of having friends is shown in the life of this para paralytic man. In fact, it was because of his friends, his four friends, that allowed him not only to be forgiven from his sins, right? but also allowed him to be healed from his sickness of being paralyzed. So three things, church, helpful friends, right? The place, we have to look at the place where these things had happened. The first two verses of this uh, passage in Mark chapter 2 verses 1 to 12 talks about the scenario where these things happen. Um, this, this particular story happened in the city of Capernaum. Uh, in YouTube it is uh, pronounced as Capernaum. Sometimes I'm trying to, to really find the proper pronunciation of especially of difficult and hard words that we can find in the Bible. Right? If you pronounce uh, Capernaum, right? The miracle, of course, in, of course, in as you read it, it's Capernaum, but in YouTube it says Capernaum, so we'll pronounce it as Capernaum. Right? Uh, the, and follow me as we read along, verses one through two, uh, in, in the New International Version. Uh, the Scripture tells us a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. So look at this church. Um, the place was called Capernaum. Right? If you look at the map of Israel, you will find Capernaum on the western portion of the Sea of Galilee. Galilee. So it means that this is in the northern portion of Israel. Right? And one thing that really we can we can look and, and be uh, I guess uh, focused upon is the word he had come home right uh, we thought that Jesus came from Nazareth right why did the scripture mention that he had come home in Capernaum right? uh, we can glean and understand from this that Capernaum was really like a second home to our Lord Jesus Christ in fact Capernaum was his home base in his public ministry most of his apostles were in the surrounding areas of Capernaum. In fact, this particular house, you know, during that time you will, you will find the, the house of the people there uh, in, in those times, like a rectangular box, either one or two stories um, houses, and the architecture, the structure of the house is in the middle, you have what we call a courtyard, right? Courtyard. And when you open the door as you enter the house, there's a porch that leads to a courtyard. So picture this in your mind. Maybe Jesus was teaching and preaching, right? Look at what he was doing. He preached the word to them. Okay, that was his main, main intent, right? People were there uh, to, to listen to Jesus. Really? But if you look at Mark chapter 1, you will find there that Jesus started his his ministry but at the same time Jesus already healed started healing the sick and in the lower portion of the bottom portion of chapter 1 you will find there that he just recently cured a leper right so because maybe of the excitement of the people Jesus went away for a while and and the first portion of this verse says a few days later right meaning after he has uh, healed the leper he came back and people heard that he was back right and there was excitement in the air. Jesus who healed the leper was back. And people came to that place. And the history would dictate, and it was not really an assurance that this place was really uh, the house of Simon in Capernaum, right? 
Uh, this was served as the base for the public ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, this was the place where the miracle occurred here in Capernaum. So, picture this in your mind as we go along. That's two verses, right? And the second portion of this, right, is the paralytic. This was the, the focus of the miracle of what Jesus did, right? Jesus healed the paralytic. Let's look at this, right? In Mark, uh, or the, his friends carried him to Jesus. Remember the story? And we're going to read this again, right? Because the house, the place where Jesus was while he was teaching, they were full of people, right? No one can get into the house anymore. Right? I can't imagine the, the house to be very big, right? Maybe people were overflowing on the houses and the name of the neighbors. And there was no way if you were uh, someone who wanted to, to see Jesus, right? If you got there late, uh, there was no way for you to, uh, to get in uh, and also to, to have Jesus uh, in front of you. So what did these friends do? Right? Remember the story? Right? This was a, uh, a friend, those friends really, uh, who, who was very helpful. They will do everything. For their friends. Do you have friends like that? Right? Do you have friends that will not stop in any hindrances that come their way in order for you for them to just help you, to be able to help you? Right? Are they or you have friends that are easily discouraged? Right? That when you know hard times comes, uh, you cannot see them anymore. Or you always say that those are not your real friends. Remember that, right? But real friends stick with you through thick and thin and will do everything that they can. To help you out and these are the friends of the paralyzed man right uh, they were they couldn't get in they were carrying him via stretcher and they call it bed uh, bed skits during that time it was made of uh, of, of uh, wool uh, sheep skin right it was not so elegant right these are really some some of the the beds that uh, poor people uh, use, right? Especially the paralyzed man. Right? If you were a, para a, a, a paralytic, I think it was a, caused by a secession of one of your nerves, right? This was not by an accident, right? So something happened to this man. He is paralyzed, he has friends, and the friends were so creative and they were so, uh, I guess, uh, zealous in trying to help their friend to be healed by Jesus Christ. They heard probably that the leper was healed by Jesus. They want to bring their friend in front of Jesus. So what did they do? They climbed up the roof, right? And they, because there were too many people, they cut a hole in the roof. Right? They're probably getting trouble with Peter. <laughs> Imagine that, you know, making a hole in the roof, right? And they lowered their friend right, through a rope so that the friend will be able to be in front <coughs> of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verses 3 and 4, the scripture tells us some men bringing to him a paralyzed man, right, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered that man. The man, the man, I mean to say, the man was lying. Can you imagine this? How, I guess, creative the, these friends were, right? I, I don't know if you will do it for your friend, what these friends did, right? To the paralyzed man, right? Nothing would stop them in helping this man to be able to reach Jesus Christ. Right? Because they know, right? They know that Jesus can heal him. And that was their intent, was to help their friend at all cost. Maybe they were sent a deal for whatever destruction they did in the house, right? Uh, but I guess, nonetheless, they were able to help their friends. But look at their, their reaction here, the third point. We saw that the, about the help, help of friends, the place, the place was Capernaum, right? We saw the paralytic man, right? They, 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 he was helped by his friends, right? His friends carried him to Jesus and see the pardon. What was so important and maybe surprising about this whole story was that the paralytic, right, inst uh, you know, instead of Jesus looking at the paralytic or paralyzed man and healing him, right, Jesus Christ did not do that initially. 
you will be surprised what Jesus did. Right? Jesus Christ initially, and I think this is more important, forgave him of his sins. Right? So if you, you know, if you were Jesus Christ and you saw someone, you know, putting down this man right, through a stretcher in front of you, and you can see the man to be paralyzed because the man cannot stand up, right? Right then, there and then you can conclude and summarize that that man needed healing, right, from you. And you have been healing people at that time. And so, the, I guess, the logical thing to do is to heal that man, right? But that was not what Jesus did. And, and you know, picture this in your mind, put this in your mind. This is the powerful story, right, that we can understand from this. And remember, this is all related to our theme, bearing fruits now. Right? The important thing for that man is not for him to be healed from his physical sickness. The more important thing for that man was for him to be forgiven for, from his sins. And that's what Jesus did. Right? When Jesus saw the man, he forgave the man from his sins. Right? Mark chapter 2, verse 5, the scripture tells us, when Jesus saw their faith, again, this were, were the faith of the friends of the paralyzed man. But also, if you were the paralyzed man and you will have to consent to what your friends are doing, right? You also have this faith in Jesus that you really wanted to see him, right? But when Jesus saw the faith of these friends of this paralyzed man, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins were forgiven. Can you imagine this? Would you think that that was the thing that the man needed during that time? For his sins to be forgiven? You would think, right, that if you were the paralyzed man, the uppermost in your thinking would be for you to be healed. Correct? Right? But that was not really what Jesus did. Jesus saw what this man needed the most. Right? And the thing that this man needed the most was for this man to be forgiven from his sins, right? It seems strange. Jesus forgave him first, right? Rather than heal him. But Jesus' purpose will be re revealed as we proceed the story. So the first portion of the story was about helpful friends, right? Now take this into your heart and mind, right? Either you can be a helpful friend to a friend in need, or be grateful for having friends right, that allowed you to experience the healing grace that Jesus has given you today. Right? Second thing, church, is this. Yes, we have helpful friends, but we also have host hostile or hostile foes. Right? Hostile foes. Who are these foes? Right? I, the story could have been really very uh, 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 an easy thing or an enjoyable story, but if there are no foes, it won't be that exciting, right? <laughs> Would you agree? Right? If you are watching a movie or a, or a television show, if, if everything is so happy, there will come a time that you you know you will not watch it anymore because there is really no excitement. But always there's excitement here in our story, right? We will see two things here. We will see the disdain of the scribes. There were teachers of the law in that particular house. I'm also surprised, right? If they really don't believe in Jesus Christ, why would we, they would be there? Why would they have their presence there? Or maybe they're there just to see what's going on, right? To, to be always on top of the news, right? And see what Jesus will do or has been doing. And what was in their heart was to accuse Jesus of blasphemy. You know, if you were a, a religious leader, right? Or a, a teacher of the law, I mean to say. And you heard someone, you would think it's just a mere man telling someone, your sins are forgiven. You would be shocked. Because in their understanding, who alone can forgive sins? God. Only God. And, and from the standpoint of the teachers of the law, they are correct. From the standpoint of the religious leaders or the scribes, they are probably correct because really only God can forgive sins. 
But their application of what they know is the problem, right? Because they didn't see who this person was or is, who, who was on their midst, in their midst. I mean to say, it was Jesus Christ, right? the Son of Man, the God in flesh. Right? And look at what this verse, oh, the, the definition of blasphemy is, 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 right? It is the act of insulting or showing contempt. Why is it an act of insulting? Why it is an act of, of lack of reverence for God? Because it is an act of claiming the attributes only given to a deity, to a God. Right? Only God can forgive sins. Right? And, and remember, let me just backtrack a little bit. Right? In Mark chapter 2, in Capernaum, when Jesus was doing his public ministry, he was only starting in his ministry. He just prob probably gathered the twelve, his apostles, and he was just starting his public ministry. He was still in Capernaum, right? And, and, and he was really not known well during that time. And people are just starting to follow him. And all of a sudden, Jesus did this in the minds of the scribes and the teachers of the law, right? It is not acceptable for someone who they think is just mere man to say, your sins are forgiven. Church, let's, let's pause for a little bit, put this in our hearts, right? Because we are in for a treat of what will happen next. Right? Because we will understand the reason right, why Jesus did this. It's for us to be assured that He is truly the only one that can forgive our sins. The only one that truly has the power to forgive us Amen. from our sins. Look at Mark chapter 2, verses 6 to 7, right? Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? Now remember, they were just thinking, right? They haven't spoken any word yet against Jesus Christ. Now, this is also the first time that we can see that the religious leaders or the teachers of the law had something against Jesus Christ. They were not sure yet on how to confront this. This is very new to them. They haven't spoken the word. This was just in their minds, right? They were thinking. What were they thinking? That he's blaspheming, right? Who can forgive sins but God alone? This was in the hearts and minds of these scribes and these religious leaders. Right? Uh, as to this pronounced forgiveness of Jesus, let me just pick your curiosity and your mind this afternoon. Because, you know, probably we have these two questions that we want to ask, right? First, why did he forgive the man's sins? Why do you think? When Jesus saw the man, the first thing that he did was to forgive his sins. Maybe he saw that the man's primary need was salvation from his sins, forgiveness from his sins. It might be that he was really very sick during that time. Sometimes Jesus would see that the, the man uh, at that time, even though he has the capacity to heal him physically, but he understood what is important, right? more important for that man. And for that man, what was more important was for that man to be forgiven from his sins. The second question probably you might ask is this. Why did he pronounce the forgiveness so publicly? There, was too many, there were too many people, right? Were there too many people during the time? Yeah. Now the room or the house was too full. No one can even enter the house. The friends needed to, to climb up the roof, right? And dig a hole in the roof so that they can just lower down their friends. Right? But Jesus forgave this man's sins very publicly. And what was probably the reason, right? As the terms of pardon prescribed in the law, here where it was not yet full force because Jesus was just starting his ministry. Right? The purpose here was to so show that Jesus has the power to forgive sins. And He will prove this. 
He will prove that He has the power to forgive sins. As we go along with these verses. The second thing is this, the defense of the Savior. The, the, the disdain of the scribes, you know, they were shocked probably because in their hearts and minds, Jesus is committing blasphemy. But Jesus defended himself. One of the few instances he did this, right? Because he truly has the power to forgive sins. And how did he do this? How did he do this in our story? Right? In verse 8, follow me. Right? If you have your Bibles, continue reading. Right? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this, this was what they were thinking in their hearts. Now remember, the scribes did not say anything. Right? They did not vocally, audibly complain to Jesus Christ. They didn't say those words that they were thinking in their minds and in their hearts. So to me, I think this is another miracle that Jesus has shown us here. That Jesus Christ knows our thoughts. What is in our thoughts, in our minds, and in our hearts. Right? Because look at this verse, right? Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Did he look at probably the eyes of the scribes and he asked these questions or this question? Why are you thinking these things? I like what verse 9 um, said here in our verse. Right? Maybe I will ask you this question. Church, multiple choice. Right? Is that filling in the blanks? Right? Which is easier? To say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, first option, right? first choice, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. Church, what do you think? Which is easier, right? to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say to this paralyzed man, get up, right? take your mat, and walk. Which one is easier? You, you probably are thinking right now which one is easier or not, right? Probably the first one, right? It's easier to say your sins are forgiven. I can say that to any one of you this afternoon. That your sins are forgiven. Would you believe me? That's the question. Would you believe me if I tell you your sins are forgiven? Or you will accuse me of blasphemy. Right? I say, Daniel, your sins are forgiven. You might say, Amen! Right? <laughs> but I cannot do that. Because I do not have the power to forgive sins. I might be able to get away with it. Right? Because no one can really prove right now, visibly, whether your sins are forgiven or not. You might come out here blessed and, and really change your life, and that might be enough proof that yes, Pastor is right, my sins were forgiven. Right? But Jesus Christ said those things first. Your sins are forgiven. And then the, the scribes had in their hearts this question, Who is this man? Who do you think he is? Blasphemy! Because only God can forgive sins. That's why this was the question of Jesus Christ to the scribes. Right? Which is easier? To say to this man, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say to this man, Get up, take up your mat, your mat. And walk. The same man that was being, I guess, used to lay down for many years by this man would be the same man, or the same man, I mean to say, that he will pick up and carry. Very ironic, right? And he will walk. Which one is easier? Verse 10, look at this, very powerful, right? But I want you to know that the Son of Man 
has authority on earth to forgive sins. So that is the more important thing for Jesus Christ. For them to understand that Jesus Christ has the power to forgive sins. Jesus knew their hearts. Their reasoning, right? The, the, the scribes, even though they didn't say any word or words, Jesus Christ knew what, he, what was in their hearts. Maybe today for us, you know, it's a, a great application. Jesus Christ, our God, knows our thoughts, our innermost thoughts. He knows about it. Would you agree, church? Right? He knows about it. Right? I'm hoping we have godly thoughts, pure thoughts, not sinful thoughts or, or evil thoughts. And not only that, right? When he said which is easier to say, to forgive or to heal. It's easier probably during that time to forgive. But Jesus Christ used that as the opportunity to show His power. And His power was Jesus Christ has the power to forgive sins. We were discussing in our Sunday school earlier, right? The idea of salvation. You know, we've been studying about conversion or conversions in the book of Acts. The story about how the, you know, the early Christians were converted. Right? And our premise there, what we're studying that, is how the initial believers or the first believers were converted because there's only one book of history in the Bible, in the New Testament, which is the book of Acts, right? It should be consistent on how those first believers were converted and the teachings in the, the book of Acts should be consistent on how we are converted today, right? If there are any teaching or different that came out from the second century to the 21st century that is different from how the first believers were converted, then that is not the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ pertaining to conversion or salvation for that man, for that fact, right? And so we, we talk there the importance, the idea of salvation. Why we say we need salvation is we are being saved from the penalty of sin, which is death, right? The idea of salvation is being saved from sin. And that is why Jesus, even at the start of his ministry, was very particular to, to show that Jesus Christ has the power to forgive sins. Because he is God. And that is what he is trying to say in this particular narrative of the scriptures. That can be found in Matthew, can be found, found in Mark, and can be found in Luke. Right? Third and last church. We have helpful friends. We have hostile foes. And last, we have a happy finale. Now, we, we like these things, right? For the paralytic, the paralytic was not only forgiven from his sins, the paralytic was healed from his sickness. In my part, chapter 2, 11 to 12, look at this. Prior to this, let me just give you verse 9 again. Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, Jesus' words were, these were Jesus' words, he was saying this, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your man and walk. Right? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So now I tell you, in front of everyone, right? in front of the scribes, I tell you, Take your man and go home. Those were the words of Jesus Christ. He could have just said that initially. The first thing he saw, the paralyzed man, he could just have said those words. Get up, take your man and go home. But it would be just any other person that he has healed or had healed, right? But there is more to that because he wanted to show everyone that he has the authority and power to forgive sins. That's why he told the paralyzed man, 
your sins are forgiven. And when the scribes started to think like, the thoughts that they had about Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ said, I tell you, right? I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And what happened, church, in verse 12, right? What happened? We know this, the happy finale, right? He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. Was the paralyzed man, was he able to walk, church? Yeah. Was he able to be healed? Yeah. What does that tell us? Does that only tell us that Jesus has the power to heal? That's a given. What Jesus wanted to show, He has the power to forgive sins. Right? And He showed that. Right? Visibly. The proof is He healed this man. And this man was able to walk. Pointing to the fact that the man first was forgiven from his sins. Why? Because Jesus had the power to forgive sins. This was the intent of his friends, right? To make him well, to make the man be able to walk, right? By giving him the chance to see Jesus. Unbeknownst to them, little did they know, they were, that this man was really in for a big treat, more than what they expected. The man was not only healed physically, right? the man was also healed spiritually. But the proof that Jesus was able to heal that man spiritually was that that man was able to walk. I can tell you, your sins are forgiven. But you will not believe me. Because I can, if you cannot walk, I cannot make you walk. I don't have that power. I cannot get away with just telling you your sins are forgiven. And that was what the scribes were trying to test Jesus with. Right? Because they say, anyone can say your sins are forgiven. This man is committing blasphemy. But Jesus Christ showed Right? That he has really power to forgive sins by healing the paralyzed man. And also I would like to point to the importance of having friends, faithful friends. Right? And I'm hoping that we can be a faithful friend to someone who needed to be seen by Jesus Christ. To be healed, not only by, you know, physically, but more importantly, spiritually. And last church, look at this. The happy finale for the people as well, because the, those people were really, who were there, who saw what happened, they were truly amazed. And God was glorified. Look at verse 12. This amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, Who we have never seen anything like this. There were three miracles, right? That happened in that particular story. Sins were forgiven. Jesus Christ said to the man, to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. Jesus was also able to, to, to read the thoughts, the innermost thoughts of the scribes, right? Telling them what they were thinking. Telling them that they thought that he was committing blasphemy. And last, what we all expected was Jesus Christ was able to heal the paralyzed man. The importance of us understanding this, right? That only in Jesus there is forgiveness of sins. And Jesus Christ has the power to forgive sins. And maybe one of our friends, a couple of our friends, help us to realize that. A man healed, people amazed. Right? Jesus' power made known. This is the story of the healing of the paralyzed man. But most of all, God 
is glorified. Have we looked to Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins? Our challenge also this afternoon, we can relate mostly to this, a very practical application, right? So that we can bear fruits now for every one of us, right? Nurture our network of friends with faith and share our faith with them. Why? Because we have been given much of the Lord. We are, if we are able to be forgiven from our sins, let us do the same for others, especially for our friends, right? We have been given much, let us also give, give back much in return. Church, for you who are here, want them, stretch your bearers. Maybe you have friends, relatives, loved ones that needed to see Jesus today. Maybe they are not physically sick. But they need, first and foremost, forgiveness from their sins. Carry them today to see Jesus Christ. You know, these friends, they understood that if they did not do what they did, if they didn't try to, to bring their friends right, to see Jesus at that particular time, they might have missed the opportunity already. Because we can see that Jesus would be traveling again. And their friends being lame or paralyzed will not have a chance again to see Jesus Christ and be healed. There is a sense of urgency. If you are truly a good and authentic friend or friends, maybe you have more friends right now, be a stretcher better. Bring them to the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. And for some of you who are here, someone brought you here. Your friends brought you here to understand that Jesus has the power to forgive your sins. Maybe we cannot afford breaking the roof of this church. The doors are very wide. And you are physically able to come here. But when Jesus will see you or has seen you today, Jesus will see upon you your sins. And if you ask for forgiveness because of your faith to Him, I tell you, Jesus will say, your sins are forgiven. The paralyzed man walked in front of everyone. The people were amazed and everyone glorified God. Any one of you this afternoon who would walk upon this aisle, come up front, I tell you, everyone will be amazed. Everyone will be happy and God will be glorified. Come up front this afternoon. Any one of you would like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because Jesus Christ does not only have the power to heal those who are sick, Jesus Christ has the power to forgive your sins and mine. We are stretcher betters today. If any one of you would like to come, we can see that we will be fruitful now. Let's all stand up, church. Let's all give glory to God.